Okay. So until more people oh, needs admission. Uh, yes, you can simply. Can I? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Feel free. Uh, it's just go over the names. Ensure they are they're like you know to be trusted. Okay. Okay. So I already control the security of the room, allowing just um, chat. So, okay. and uh, keep a good eye on the chat box if you wish. I I should be doing that, of course. But in case, uh, what, yeah. What if uh, like? Um... Uh, we do not allow the chat box to work until each of us is done with his part. Too uh, restrictive, too restrictive. I yeah. mean, it shouldn't be distracting to you anyways. The chat box is very, you know, it's a, I would say a back channel. So allowing the audience something here to do, right. uh, to interact is a nice thing, really. Yeah, so, um, how long each of us um, has time to share his stance? Um, well, the beginning here to be four to five. Okay, that's the initial uh, starting uh, statements. And then, okay, rebuttal, rebuttals, give it like two minutes each, um, you know. And later on, it's just you go with the flow. Okay, so it's less, um, you know, restrictive, less structured. Later on, it's free flowing. All right. All right. So um, let's give it one more minute. And just so we know, uh, we are already live on Facebook. Okay, not recording yet. So smile. We're smiling here, I hope. <laughs> smiling when we record? Yeah, definitely. I mean, smiling is the best thing about live videos here. Yeah, we already have some good number of people in the room. And we're starting in exactly one minute. Dr. Hagig um, is actually joining us from campus. Um, is that in her gada or Luxor? Yeah, in, in her gada, actually in her gada, yeah. You know, we're busy these days with uh, research papers. And <laughs> very deep research papers, you know that? Yeah, very deep. Relaxing yeah. research paper. This COVID-19 issue is, is, you know, uh, having lots of epic university or scheduled university correction and so on. So we're uh, spending many time and, and lots of hours uh, at night and online. So this is why I think most of university professors are in campus and uh, most of the time doing lots of, you know, uh, activities and related to correction and so on. And, and, and this, this is actually uh, very good for, uh, for me to have this uh, uh, online connection and meeting. And um, so I'm very uh, delighted to be in campus with you. <laughs> Interesting. I have to say, I envy you, Dr. Haggad, because uh, your campus is directly on the Red Sea. Yeah, it overlooks it the. Uh, yeah. 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 Wasn't it I that beautiful? So, yeah. yeah, it, it was, was beautiful. Uh, I remember. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's the only Egyptian uh, college which is uh, on the sea. Yeah, oh, uh, yeah. I mean, sure. I, I think uh, you're fighting hard for keeping the campus, aren't you? Yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah, we yeah. already had a new, a, a new campus, but still we, 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 we have this campus, yeah. It would be a pity if you lose it here. Yeah, I think we will not because it has a wonderful effect on the uh, cognition of the, <laughs> of the students. <laughs> and effect. Uh, effect, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, this is the faculty of education in Hergada, right? Exactly, exactly, yeah, it's, exactly. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's Hergada it's Faculty of Education. Yeah, yeah this yeah. is it. And I think it's, it's South right Valley right. Uh, University, right? Yes, it's part of South Valley University, yeah. Yeah, so South We Valley. had an IELTS event. Yeah. Professional development. It's one of the very early ones. Yeah, something that we uh, are really proud of. I remember the Hergada event, something hard to forget, really. Who knows, maybe one day we go back to the same campus. Yeah, and we're lucky to have uh, the new campus this year. We have two new uh, colleges, the uh, College of Al Alson, the Faculty mm -hmm. of Languages, and the uh, Faculty of Computers and Artificial Intelligence as well. So mm -hmm. we're going to have two new colleges this year, which makes mm -hmm. it a big campus.
<laughs> Very nice. Actually, the All right. PG event started in Hergeda, that was back in 2015. Uh, oh, yeah. It was nice. The, the person who um, thought about going out of Cairo, let's move, guys, enough people, everybody comes to Cairo, so let's move. So uh, um, in 15, we went to Hergeda and uh, Aswan, actually. Um, and Hergeda one was very successful. We had an event that um, we had how many? Almost 150 persons. So and it changed a lot. Changed it yeah, really definitely. Like it's we are about to start so one two and three hello ladies and gentlemen it's wonderful to have you here so let me officially start off here our session this is Hene Hamis today is July the 15th now um, 8 p.m Cairo time um, I have the pleasure and honor uh, to introduce uh, our discussants or deb debaters for today's session, our second debate for uh, Night Easel Professional Development Committee. Um, so uh, let me first um, introduce our guest speaker, very special guest speaker. She's actually not a guest speaker. She's been a resident, okay, uh, speaker in, in Egypt, Cairo, Egypt. And she's always welcome uh, in, in our country. Now she's in the United States. Hopefully uh, we can have her back sometime very soon. Um, Dr. Liz England. Um, Dr. Liz England, um, apart from being, uh, you know, I would say, are you a, Professor Emirat, uh, um, Dr. Ah, England, ah. at the moment, yes. You, you. I would say you said like uh, midway and retirement here. We're celebrating, um, you like halfway through that. Um, Dr. England at the moment here is a professor and a principal at Liz England and Associates in the United States. Originally a professor at various uh, esteemed universities, one of which was. Um, uh, uh, the American University in Cairo, where I had the pleasure to be one of her students. Um, thank you, Dr. England, for joining us today. Thank you. Um, she's quite a prolific, um, you know, speaker and uh, author of several books, articles. Uh, I've got her own blog. You definitely would like to check her latest publications, very recent ones. Uh, congratulations. You're a featured speaker at, um, uh, is that uh, Rotler? Uh, where is that? Um, I forgot the latest book. Yeah, Rotledge. Okay, oh, Rotledge nice. featured speaker. So thank you again for joining us, uh, Dr. England. Uh, and in this on the same team, uh, at the opposing team uh, today, we have uh, Wei Elaimer, a dear friend and colleague. Dr. Wael Amir in the very near future, inshallah. Uh, Wael um, is a, an assessment specialist uh, in, uh, originally. At the moment, he works at the American University in Cairo um, in what they call monitoring and evaluation, MEL, monitoring, evaluation, and learning. In that unit, which unit is that, Wael? It's got four... <laughs> Uh, yeah, and I hope you can speak up a little because your voice is a little. It's the university centers <clears throat> for career development. Exactly. Project. Yeah, it's a very interesting kind of project here. Um, uh, Whale is a, um, a PhD candidate um, in uh, the UK, uh, University of London. Is that right? And hopefully you'll be joining us. Merged with UCL, so now it's University College London. Okay, well, if you've got your headset, it'd be great if you get it, okay? Uh, can, can okay. okay. Is, is this way better? Uh, the point is, yeah, you need to speak up a little, okay? So it would be best. like, yeah, sure, sure. You have quite a, you know, um, I would say a teacher's voice. So use your teacher's voice here. I'll use it harder. <laughs> Not much better. Uh, uh, on the other side, uh, supporting uh, the motion or the proposition for today, we got two uh, special speakers here. 
uh, Dr. Hageg Mohammed. Dr. Hageg um, um, has been with Night Easel as a presenter uh, for some time, a very popular speaker uh, in our events. I mean, students simply love him. Professor Hageg um, uh, works at the um, um, South Valley University uh, at two beautiful campuses, one of which is in Hergada, the other one in uh, Luxor, both of which we had very special events. Uh, we've always, I mean, we're always grateful uh, when he hosts us over there. We have very distinguished <laughs> kind of events. In addition to that, Dr. Hageg again, has recently uh, published something, I think a dictionary of Islamic terms. Yeah. It is a dictionary as for Islamic terms, yeah. Among yeah. other books, anything, uh, would you like to share Dr. Hageg as well? Other publications? Um, yeah, I have been an editor for the European Scientific Journal and published lots of research in the field of language teaching and linguistics. Plus I translated two other books in about the European education. One of them is about the European portfolio for student teachers of languages, and another one about the best practices for European portfolio use in language education. Uh, it's all European. Is. Interesting. I mean, what about yeah, the other because side? I got my PhD from Europe. Because I got my PhD okay. from Europe from Austria. This okay. is why I'm in a European education-oriented research. Yeah, so you're specialized at this part of the world. Um, Together with Dr. Hageg on the supporting side here is Amira Erfen, a good friend and colleague. We've worked together um, as teacher trainers um, uh, back in uh, Notting Hill College. And among other things, I've realized that Amira at a certain point in time, like years ago, a few years ago, she was the professional development committee chair at Nile Tiesel. Was that 2015, Amira? Um, 15, 16, 17, yeah, right. Right, okay, uh, very interesting indeed. Uh, so Amira um, uh, today uh, is um, joining us here in support of the statement and um, Amira, would you like to share any other special kind of, uh, you know, um, I would say um, accomplishments uh, apart from being a teacher trainer freelance as myself? Right, you're freelancing at the moment. You're working with Capital Professional Development at the moment, right? Right. Right. Actually, um, I've been uh -huh. in the education field for a long time, like probably 20 years now. I know speaking about the numbers is not a good thing when women talk. Uh, it does not tell anything about my age at all. Of course, uh, you're as young as ever. Be... We're all young as <laughs> ever, yeah. Exactly. Of course. Uh, the thing is like, um, as I always say, like education field is quite relevant to each other. So uh, once you jump into the education field, you end up doing everything has to do with education, learning and teaching, learning and teaching and teaching to adults, uh, teaching to young uh, learners, uh, doing your um, uh, seminars, doing your uh, presentations and in, uh, international uh, conferences and local conference course, uh, education management, definitely. Um, so actually I've been through almost everything. Um, latest thing uh, was like uh, being an international certified uh, teacher trainer uh, from World Learning and then um, um, teaching our education management in the STEM schools and USAID. Um, I think it all started with my, uh, my degree from NYU because it really enlightened uh, up your mind once you get exposed to different tracks in life and how you are supposed to help every single person you are able to reach out. So I'm kind of mix of everything, uh, which I'm taking it as a, a privilege. Of course, of course. And I know that you've taught at Zuwail <clears throat> program at a certain point in time, Zuwail City for Science and Technology. Yes, it was not kind when of was teaching. That? Yeah, that was um, about a year and a half ago. It was, again, uh, education management field for uh, professional development, again, committee, reaching out uh, to uh, different uh, trainers and programs outside to help them uh, use and benefit uh, um, professors. 
Thank you very much, Amir, and a real pleasure and honor to have you all. I don't want to take uh, much of your time anymore. Let's go, uh, okay, with the order of first, okay, uh, supporting the, the motion for today. Today, we're discussing that uh, proposition. Um, women are, are, are actually not, uh, they outnumber, so women outnumber men in the fields of language learning and teaching. And that's an observation here. It's just a matter of look at, uh, look around you and you just see for yourself. It's a fact. However, the reason is what we're debating today. What is it that really uh, makes this happen? Is it a matter of cognitive abilities um, or cognitive skills? Or is it a matter of other reasons? things that could relate to social abilities, social skills, societal re reasons or so. So this is uh, actually the proposition. Actually, it starts with they outnumber because of cognitive reasons. All right, whether you're for or against, we'll be happy to hear. So first, Dr. Hageg and Amira, I'll be muting myself for the moment and the floor is yours. Well, uh, would you like to start first? Uh, this is Amira, ladies first. <laughs> How do you think? Okay, another rumor stereotype, ladies first, <laughs> which is good <laughs> and bad. <laughs> all right, thank you, Dr. Hage. Uh, hello, everyone. It's sure. a real pleasure to be with you all tonight, all teachers and learners. Um, I'd like to start with extending my gratitude to Dr. Hana Khamis uh, for her generous invitation to join another promising PD event. Uh, I think those debates events are really um, promising, are really successful ones. Um, and as Dr. Hannah mentioned, it feels like home being with the PD committee again. Um, jumping into the theme for tonight, uh, actually the gender distinction between males and females in language learning has always been an ongoing controversial area. Uh, for debate along years, among teachers, among learners, among students, among um, parents, and uh, among uh, neuroscientists. So it is a rich area to discuss, and it's a really good choice, Dr. Hane. Hard one, though. Um, mentioning, speaking about you as teachers, I trust that almost every single person here has the experience teaching or learning. Uh, a different or a second language. Uh, I'll start with teachers as key players in my stance. Um, many foreign language teachers around the world usually know that most of girls are more open and willing to learn foreign languages than boys, right, teachers? Uh, boys are noted to show more concrete reasons to learn foreign languages. You know, boys are into the point more than girls, so they always have more concrete motives. Uh, reasons like uh, probably finding a good job, maybe getting promoted in such a job or another, uh, or immigrating to a different country, so they need to learn the language of such country, or in some few cases, getting married to someone from this different country, so they need to manage their language in order to get their paperwork processed easier. We don't know those people, we just heard about them. But accordingly, many foreign teachers by experience, only mainly by experience, concluded to that fact that girls uh, are mostly better at learning foreign languages than boys. Um, I'm not sure if any of the attendees would like uh, agree or disagree with this. Um, most likely, um, if you were a female, then you will go for this by nature. Yes, we are better anyway. Yes, anything and everything. My second key supporters, uh, or actually my second key stance, um, foundation for my stance has to do with neuroscientists. Um, they have been running wide and deep uh, studies all around in order to investigate if women outnumber men in language learning and teaching, uh, but for different reasons, maybe for cognitive reasons. This is what do they uh, work on more. And uh, they built their research studies based on uh, two key facts. 
uh, number one, speaking science, all right? Number one, women's cognitive skills make them more diligent, more hardworking, uh, and better organized. It's not for their social backgrounds. It's not for the way that they are brought up with. It mainly has to do with their cognitive uh, skills. And this is why uh, women most likely often get better class results than men. Teachers can correct me um, in learning and teaching different languages. So this is their very first uh, foundation. Uh, still speaking about the neuroscience, their second uh, foundation when it comes to their research and investigation has to do with the, with the fact that when learning a target language, female learners usually reject uh, interlanguage forms that are different from the target language norms. Uh, instead, they try to incorporate new linguistic forms in the target language more readily, more rapidly than uh, men do. And this is uh, as per Elias in O12. Um, those two facts uh, that the um, neuroscientists um, build their assumptions and investigations on uh, actually uh, help them to conclude to the following uh, points. Number one, which would make sense, uh, when performing language tasks, boys and girls rely on two different parts of the brain. Yes, this is the way we are uh, designed. This is a way that God created our own brains. Two different parts of the brains are in control of language tasks for males and females. And those areas of the brains are associated with language. They work harder uh, in girls than they do in boys during the language tasks. Proved, statistically proved. Uh, this is what do they say, scientists. <clears throat> And as we grow older, boys have larger brains. Yes, yes, yes. However, girls grow more quickly. And the very last point, which I really, really like, and I'm a big fan for, for it, has to do with the conversation and communication style for both boys and girls. Actually, conversation and communication are major keys in foreign language learning and teaching, you know, as teachers. Um, what I like is, you know, the stereotype about boys and girls. Males usually prefer conversations that are more direct, into the point, short, uh, counting on their, on their sensory approach. While females prefer conversations that include details, uh, more details, uh, much more details and details and details, kind of abstract in approach. And maybe this is the reason for which most of the females perform relatively worse than males on multiple choice tests, those uh, direct questions, while they do much better uh, on open-ended tests. And speaking about language learning, we as teachers, we know that language has uh, many skills and sub-skills, and they are all full of details and details and details. No wonder why women find themselves more convenient in languages. Accordingly, uh, neuroscientists uh, concluded to the fact that girls are better at learning foreign languages than boys for cognitive reasons. Now, teachers have proved uh, the same thing based on their own experience, teaching and learning experience, and scientists, neuroscientists specific. Um, counted on the cognitive reasons, uh, which made me uh, stand on my belief that uh, women, not me, not we, women uh, are kind of better learner uh, and teacher for language. And that's it. And for the material or the evidence or the research um, uh, resources. Uh, I have them. I've shared them with Dr. Hane in case if anybody would like to uh, ask for. Thank you, Amir, that, for yes. uh, that very strong uh, introductory statement here. So you're quite, okay, strong on how better, okay, women and girls are, are by nature in language learning and teaching. And of course, we can share the materials that you have for studies. How about Dr. Hagik? Well, um, hello yeah. everyone. I would like I would like first to uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Hena, for this uh, 
uh, shift in um, in uh, professional development events, getting research into the practice of uh, language learning and teaching in Egypt. And this is a dream. You know, we have been uh, dreaming up, you know, years and years ago. We were attending, you know, uh, I mean, university doctors and professors when they attend. Uh, Nile tea, so they think that they are in an island and what the people are practicing, it's a totally different island. So putting this together, this is a success that I would like to thank you personally for, for this. This is number one. And I would like uh, to thank our um, dear friends and colleagues and, and guests, Professor uh, England, uh, Dr. Amira, Dr. Wael for uh, this amazing uh, night. And of course the attendants. Um, as to uh, the motion, which is um, a wonderful motion, and actually I would recommend that we can uh, um, uh, differentiate between uh, foreign language learning and first language learning. So I, uh, if I am to add a word to the title of the motion, I would say women out, um, uh, you know, I would number um, boys or men in the field of uh, foreign language learning more than the because we all learn the language in a way or another, and this is what I'm going to talk about. Um, um, uh, as my colleague Amira just said, she, she gave wonderful proofs for, for, for why we're doing this. And before I get to my proof, I would also like to say that this is not in the two different edges. This is not a, um, an extremely uh, uh, a point of, 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 uh, of disagreement, because there are uh, uh, different research that proved that both are fine, and 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 when it mean uh, when we're going for a debate, it doesn't mean that well you're wrong and and, and, and I'm right. No, I'm, I'm just uh, providing why I'm going for this scientific point of view. Why I feel like you know it suits my ideas, my cognition about this. This is what we're trying to do, not just to prove that this is fine and this is not fine, because we have tons and hundreds of research papers that can you know, uh, prove that you know, this social effect on language learning is amazing. And we have others that can prove that you know, the uh, mental abilities and so on are having the same effect. If you review, uh, because of your time, if, if you review the literature and, and papers that dealt with foreign language learning and teaching, that you will find that this point has been discussed by four main areas of research, biology, uh, linguists, uh, linguists uh, pedagogy, and psychology. So I am here to uh, uh, summarize the four uh, areas and, and the proofs that they had provided for why uh, females may, you know, outnumber males in, in the areas of foreign language learning, and I insist on foreign language learning. Uh, number one, which is, as just Amir mentioned, uh, you know, um, the biology part. Um, females' brains, you know, uh, mature first than males. This is a fact, and I think, Professor Liz may agree with me with this. It's the, uh, the structure of the female brain, you know, the, the layers of the female brain grows fast. And uh, this consequently affects the way they produce the language. And in many research, they say that, that, that this difference can, uh, can actually move to one year language difference between males and females, which is a socially uh, horrible effect. Uh, the other proof is the uh, speech function in neurological surgery proved also that, you know, the nerves in, uh, I mean, the uh, brain nerves in, in, in female brains also mature first and grow faster than men. And this will consequently affect how, you know, the uh, lecture, you know, signals of, of, of the speech cognition and so effects. Um, also, the type of physical development, the female, females, you know, develop faster than males, and, 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 and this consequently leads to other developments in other language areas as well. Uh, so ladies communicate in language faster than boys. This is a neurological fact, biological fact that any doctor can agree. This is one thing. The other thing is linguists. Early in the beginning of the last century by Noam Chomsky and others distinguished between the two concepts of competence and performance, uh, saying that what we have in mind is different from what we can produce. This universal uh, uh, grammar sets or what we can call it, the uh, Chomsky called it UG or universal grammar component in human mind actually. Although he was talking about gardens of Aden that no one could prove or see the trees, but 
I mean, there are no uh, um, uh, biological proofs that there is this uh, universal grammar uh, set in humans, but it is there and that there is some kind of universals, both for men and both for women. There are lots of research that discuss these universals, others so that they are equal, others, you know, related to society, others related to uh, 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 cognition and so on. Uh, the other, and, and when it comes to linguists, actually the, there are three main, you know, uh, uh, waivers that proved uh, that these differences are, there are there, but for whom that's a lot of debate. Early in the 40s and 50s, it was for uh, women. And then in the 70s and 80s, generative linguists and psychology related, you know, also uh, to men in some areas, especially in foreign language and the constructivism and the, the behavioral theory or Banadora social theory. And I think Professor Lenz may uh, will, uh, will relate to it because this social theory actually uh, proved that, you know, this difference or the social cognition uh, theory proved that, you know, society has effect on, on, on language and so on. The last one is pedagogy. And when it, when it goes to pedagogy research, uh, 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 proved that, you know, exams and assessment goes well for ladies in language areas more than boys. This is why the results they have in language areas, uh, uh, well, prove and help, you know, uh, uh, females to go uh, faster and, and, our, and go on. And I have lots of research that can prove this, like uh, Ehrlich in 2008, and, and, and I have a list of them that I can send, and I can send it. So the type of pedagogy can affect how we go in language. If you are praised, if you are, you know, uh, having the ability of using the language, putting in mind that female actually use the language more than men, and then they get praised earlier than boys, this will for sure affect how they have emotionally, you know, uh, view the language. Apart from the way males uh, uh, view the language as a holistic approach, as Amira said, and uh, sorry, as a uh, you know, a structural approach while uh, females view the language as a whole and, and a holistic part, and they have this emotional part in viewing and approaching the language. And we have lots of interesting research that proved that how males uh, approach learning new or acquiring new vocabulary and females acquire new vocabulary. The way males acquire learning the new vocabulary is different, totally different from females learning. So, so there is that, that, that uh, uh, big difference. And before I get or add a, 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 one more thing, let's agree that both are internally homogeneous group. I mean, both females and both are males, they have different qualities, different traits. And I mean by qualities and traits, language and brain qualities and, and traits. And they have universes in language, males universes and females universes. You have a male language all over all over uh, the world. Although some, you know, uh, disagree with this, but the proof is, if we don't have this male universes in language, then we will have men talking in a different way in 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 in, in the states or in Europe, different from the eastern. It would be a mess. You will not have this language. Uh, uh, ability uh, with its distinctive characteristics. So uh, the different proofs or the, these four areas in the areas of bio, uh, 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 neuropsychology and biology and linguistics and, and pedagogy and made me see that there is something in ladies' brain that pushes them forward to learning the language. And this doesn't mean that I neglect the effect of society. It has a major effect on language learning. It is a distinctive effect. And, 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 and also you will, you will find that how uh, cultures view foreign language learning as a policy, as an approach, will affect how the different genders actually acquire. It. So I think this is, these are the four key areas that made me go for this motion. And I'm very you know, uh, happy to listen to the other point of view. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Hageg. That was quite thorough. I'm sure you're quite popular in your linguistics classes. Very supportive of women and girls. Well, this is science. With proof, <laughs> with everything. Yeah, with proof, All yeah, right. research.
let's okay uh now hand the floor to the opposing uh side here so uh dr england uh Weil, kindly now uh tell us here the counter evidence you have i will follow dr england oh i was going to say i would follow dr Wael. no the floor is yours no the floor is yours it's fed it's fed Okay, it sounds good. It sounds good, Lashen. This time, we're trying to be very fair to gentlemen. I mean, come on. Okay, gentlemen first. All right, for a change. You see? Thank you. Uh, if I may start again, I would like to thank Hannah and the organizers and the speakers. Uh, it's a pleasure and privilege to be um, on this event. Uh, as usual, I tend to disagree. <laughs> I mean, this is quite known about me, but I would like first to start with evidence, uh, evidence which I collected about gender differences in language learning outcomes. Um, there were many studies done in that respect internationally. Um, and uh, a lovely study is published by UNESCO. Um, and it, it traces the differences between males and females in achievement of learning outcomes in all subject matters, all grades. Uh, and it's very uh, interesting. Um, they used different assessments in different uh, parts of the world. Um, one main assessment was lab, and it's a standardized reading assessment, which was conducted in Latin America uh, during the late 90s. And there was a proven female advantage in language achievement, which became widespread as early as the fourth grade. With half of gender differences already reaching the moderate level. So in other words, boys were at risk of falling behind their female counterparts in language achievement as early as the middle grades in primary school. Um, in the Francophone African countries, um, another assessment was conducted. It's called PASIC, and all these are acronyms. And PASIC tested the ability of students to read and write in French in the second and fifth grades. At both grade levels, six out of eight participating countries demonstrated no gender differences. Sorry, guys. <laughs> so gender difference occurred only in the second grade in Burkina Faso and Madagascar both in favor of girls. In the fifth grade, gender differences were in favor of girls in Madagascar and in favor of boys in Mali, with the male advantage slightly larger than the female advantage. Interesting, huh? Isn't this interesting? Are you saying something here about third world countries? Well, no. No, no, you're not saying anything no. about that. No, okay. When you compare the lab, the lab was done in Latin America and it identified gender differences to the female advantage. The PASIC was done in African Francophone countries, African countries which speak French. And it has proven no gender differences. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. So it's tricky. I, I want to say that the field is tricky. It's very tricky. Uh, a third study is SACMIC, which tested the ability of students to read in English in grade six. Gender differences, this is in Africa again, but the, the African countries which speak English. Gender differences in English were not evident in SACMIC. With nine out of 14 participating countries showing no gender difference. However, in certain countries like Botswana, Mauritius, and South Africa, 
um, the difference was in favor of girls. Uh, with with moderate levels, but the the female advantage was large in another country, just one country, and um, there was uh, a, a case in favor of boys in Tanzania. So Tanzania, the difference is in favor of boys, Mauritius, Botswana, South Africa, a small difference in a girl's advantage. Let's come now to pearls. I think uh, many of us are familiar with pearls and PISA. Pearls uh, measured reading literacy of students in the fourth grade. And uh, gender differences for favor in favor of girls were identified in all 35 participating countries. So across the board. The female advantage was rather small in all participating countries, except Kuwait, which indicated a moderate female advantage. The category of countries uh, with the largest gender differences in leading, uh, reading literacy was dominated by being developing countries. So developing countries demonstrate um, a large um, gender difference for the advantage of females. However, New Zealand, New Zealand, which is a developed country, also demonstrated a good uh, difference for the advantage of females. Finally, PISA. And PISA indicated a clear and consistent pattern of gender differences in favor of girls at uh, grade eight across all 40 participating countries. Uh, PISA is a test developed by OECD, uh, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, and participating members are generally European countries and developed countries. For in PISA, it's uh, uh, consistent across the board. The conclusions I want to reach from uh, this presentation of evidence is that evidence itself is tricky. It's not very consistent. And you cannot take a clear line from evidence based on standardized assessments that females outdo males or that males outdo females in achievement of learning outcomes. So uh, I, I would leave the floor now to uh, Dr. England mm -hmm. uh, to present what she has, and I may follow later with interpreting. Mm -hmm. I hope for now, Yani, it, it's becoming clear. The nature of ev evidence is very tricky. Uh, you cannot develop a coherent position which supports uh, cognitive supremacy of women. I think you can easily support differences between uh, gender, that males and females are different. They learn differently. They achieve differently. But uh, not that females outdo <laughs> or are supreme to males or vice versa. Thank okay, you. thank you. Thank you, Wael. That was very interesting. But nobody said outdid or outdo. We're just talking about outnumbering. Okay, so let's see well, Dr. England's uh, perspective on that. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you all. Wael, I'm so happy to follow an assessment guy because it means I, I don't have to do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, Amazing introductions. You guys really have done an outstanding job here on a topic that I was somewhat um, uh, convinced to join. One, because it's such an interesting topic, but also because, oh, Liz, it's just going to be a nice, relaxed discussion about gender differences. I thought, oh, yay, like my, my uh, in the cafe at AUC in the old days, we would sit together and chat. Well, you guys have raised the bar. Come on. Um, this is evidence-based. It's very carefully thought out. Thank you so much for including me um, in all of this. Wael, thank you for that um, really 
outstanding as assessment, evidence-driven um, description. I'm left um, with a few comments only. Um, <laughs> really, I'm humbled. <laughs> I'm humbled by your your um, your efforts to bring this topic uh, some into my memory because I studied it a, a number of years and I've never really thought about it as much and as deeply as I am today. So it's a pleasure. Um, I've been disappointing Egyptians for years because you guys are so good at telling me that, oh, we're waiting for you to tell us the truth. And you know the, the answers. You are incredibly uh, better suited to this topic from me, but I think what I can bring here is a perspective. This blonde hair, my name is England. You know, I mean, I'm uh, what you might call an outsider here, but I love Egypt and I know Egypt. Um, my son uh, and I, my family lived there um, for six years. I have been back, I think 40 different trips across the Atlantic to Cairo airport. So I, um, my, my comments are going to be contextualized a bit in my own experience in, um, as, a, as a woman, as a female faculty member at the American University in Cairo for six years, as a uh, student of the Arabic language. Um, I had a tutor in those days, AUC provided me with, as it happens, a woman who was my tutor. She would come to my office at the old AUC Tahrir campus and she would sit with me, but she'd walk in the door. She had a lot of energy, this woman. And she'd start shouting at me in, in Egyptian Arabic. And she would be telling me some gossip about something, something very silly. But the woman taught me to speak as much Arabic as I have. And when I go back to Cairo, it comes more. But for sure, I adored this woman. And she was very funny. And she was very clever teacher of Arabic to this American woman. Um, I'm also going to talk about my Egyptian colleagues and students. Um, so the, the, the issue is women outnumber men in learning languages and in teaching languages. This is sort of the first part of the sentence that we were handed by uh, Dr. Hanak. That I, I, the research I did shows that um, in, in the world today, more women are studying in general. There are more women who are enrolling for the first time in undergraduate programs, back, uh, graduates. So the, those numbers are for sure going to skew or change the way we look at this topic. Um, but the reasons, are they cognitive? Are they social? Um, we are in a crisis now in the world. And for sure, this global pandemic has created um, local initiatives like Nile Tisol with all these wonderful events that Hannah and her, co her colleagues are organizing through Nile Tisol. Unbelie Every night there's another one. My Facebook is swimming with new activities all the time. So just locally, you're doing a lot. But nationally, internationally, there's a lot going on. And I think the women are going back to school because it's a crisis and they want something that they need in order to help themselves, their families. So I would invite us to, there's an, an article in the Atlantic. Again, I'm like everyone, I'm happy to share this stuff. Um, are they doing it for cognitive rather than social, societal? For me, it's no question that it's, it's social and societal. It's to get money. It's to get a salary. It's to become more um, marketable in the world of work. Um, so, it, uh, for me, it's easy to take the opposing position on this panel because the numbers support that. But, but I'd like to get back to my own experience and to bring it home, if you will, to the Egyptian context. Uh, Dr. Hagag was talking about Chomsky and I don't know if you mentioned Skinner and Sapir Whorf. And I just want to remind us of these um, extraordinary um, fathers and grandfathers of our, of our field. Um, as it happens, they're all men. <laughs> I just wanted to say... Um, but, but I have in my own um, AUC experience, men and women, Egyptian men and women who were very much a part of my life. I mentioned the tutor I had, my colleagues in the department, uh, uh, Dr. Zalezebi and Dr. Stevens and Dr., uh, probably some of you are too young to know these names, but Dr., um, uh, 
gosh, I can't remember everybody's name, Dr. Saad Gamel, um, so many wonderful people, um, Dr. Perry. Um, those guys were um, my colleagues. What I did was as a woman, I was a brand new PhD when I went to AUC in 1984. And I was seen by them, all of them, Egyptian and American colleagues alike at AUC, as able to do anything. There's a sense in which women are perceived to be more flexible by their colleagues, by their students. So I did every single course on that MA TEFL uh, curriculum when I was at AUC. And it was, um, and they didn't. I, I was kind of the young American who could do anything. So I don't know if that's because I'm a woman or if that's because I was young or why, but I um, was handed some very challenging uh, teaching assignments that ended up really serving me well in my career. That's a long time ago. My AUC students, both men and women were, were good. I had more women and those women were all getting uh, master's degrees as Hena was one of those wonderful students and there were many. Um, but I wanna say that just sort of by way of a, a, this is not, this is evidence is anecdote. So it's not like Dr. Wa'els and Dr. Um, Amira and, and uh, Hagag's comments, but, but, my, but I really feel strongly that um, AUC students that we had in those days and the students they worked with, we organized a practicum in those days and they went out and taught in schools. I got to go to some schools. Um, Boys and girls alike were generally good students. The boys often sat in the front row. I don't know why, but that's sort of something that I've noticed over the years. I don't know if that's still the case. I think it's changed some. Um, all of this to say times have something to do with this. There's been pressure placed, I think partly because of the evidence, the research, that it isn't such a dichotomy as um, all of us have pointed out in one way or the other. Yeah, is um, we can are they cognitive or are they social? Are those the factors? It's not so simple. Yeah, they the things come together. Um, I stood in Ewart Hall at a on uh, what it was called Egypt Tea Hall in the olden days, and I said to the audience that um, you know communicative competence was um, a concept, you've, you've read Canali and Swain, you know this, um, communicative competence is a combination of skills and knowledge. And it was a brand new paradigm shift in our field in order that um, we could give students opportunities to communicate using the language, not just to, to learn about the language. So that was a big step for us. And I said in that, talk that non-native English speaking teachers, such as the C of them in, in front of me in the audience, those teachers were all non-native English speaking teachers and many of them were women, most of them were women. And I thought that they were just as good as native speakers. And in those days, it was kind of a, a shock for people to hear it and they thought, oh, Dr. English is being so nice. No, it's true Yeah, that the Egyptian uh, students were who were teachers. Also, they were teaching. Those those folks were were outstanding. Most of them were women. That doesn't mean that there weren't any good males because the men were all in the front row in that audience, and there were many of them. And many of them are outstanding teachers. But I have to say that the vast majority of the teachers that I know uh, in Egypt are outstanding um, female teachers. Um, anecdote. Maybe it has no place. I don't know. I just trying to balance Dr. Wells very carefully evidence-based discussion here. Um, very quickly, um, learning styles. We know that there are there are different ways of acquiring new information. There are people on both sides. Some people love learning styles research. Some people don't like it at all. But in fact, it is a part of our canon in diesel and in English. Um, and I would invite us all to consider the fact that all students, male or female, have learning styles that are stronger. Right? And it doesn't matter if they're male or female. Our job as teachers is to, is to approach those learning styles, to build on the students' strengths and try to make them um, uh, better, 
users of the English language. It doesn't matter if they're male or female. Um, while Ella reported on the UNESCO st study, it's very often cited. It's one of the most often cited studies in our field. Very few gender differences. Um, in some ways, that's the end of our conversation today. Okay, there aren't any gender differences. But I also have to tell you that um, this binary approach, right? It's a male student or a female student. Binary is is kind of fading. There is new, new research, there's new movements in gender studies. Some of my colleagues in Morocco and I were talking the other day and both of those gentlemen have degrees in gender studies. Um, the, the binary approach to research is coming to an end yeah. because uh, boys have feminine characteristics in their learning style for the sake of this conversation. Girls, on the other hand, can be very analytical and very, we were talking about them, you know, sort of getting a direct answer. I mean, you, you have, you know that there are girls who do that too. Mm -hmm. So it isn't so simple as perhaps it was in the past to have this conversation, um, but I'm loving it. <laughs> it's great fun. Um, I want to just sort of close by saying that, um, social, cultural, cognitive, and linguistic factors are extremely interconnected. They are intertwined so deeply that disentangling them is really no longer an issue of, deter of, of looking at gender, yeah, or, or if it's a male or a female student or teacher for that matter. Um, for sure, the numbers are more for women. There's no question. Why? probably because of their um, sort of affective sociocultural um, conditions and contexts. But um, are they better? Are they worse? No, everyone is different. different. And, um, you know, I love Sesame Street and that's what uh, Cookie Monster always says. He says, everybody's special. <laughs> so I think I'd like to end on that and thank Cookie Monster for his wisdom. Um, uh, I, I definitely oppose this motion, and I thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Dr. England. Interesting as ever, of course, very informative indeed. And I would like to open the, uh, the floor now for rebuttals. Now you've heard the opposing side, Dr. Hageg, Amira, now it's your turn to do the rebuttals first, and then we'll listen to Dr. England and Wei. Well. Uh, thank you, Dr. England. This is uh, uh, wonderful. And thank you, uh, Dr. Wang. This is also uh, very uh, uh, specific. But I have uh, four little comments. Number one, uh, uh, when it comes uh, to money as a justification for why, mm -hmm. uh, why women or why uh, females uh, go for language learning, I think males have the, uh, this trigger, you know, as uh, are more than women. And this is can be done in the um, truthful results and, and the number of males applying for, you know, uh, language learning tests. So I don't think that money may, might be, you know, the uh, first reason why women or why females can go for language learning. Uh, what, the other thing is about flexibility. You've mentioned also, uh, uh, Dr. England, that yes, mainly females are more flexible the, and this is absolutely true, but, uh, Research also proved that this flexibility has something to do with cognition, with intelligence, more than social uh, effect. And the other point is about, you know, if I ask you a question, think about painters. How, how, tell me some names about painters. I think you will not remember a single female painter maybe, but you will find lots of uh, male painters, famous painters. Uh, so this means that there are some areas that uh, females can go with, uh, you know, or can uh, develop skills more than uh, uh, males. So this is a fact, and this doesn't mean that they are better or that, or that they are bad and so on. The other thing is uh, you also related sitting in front uh, row as a sign for uh, social, if you call it, uh, contact with language. Yes, males sit in first rows, but 
the results come, you know, not for sure in the, uh, in the beginning. So females get higher scores, even if they don't. Yeah. This doesn't also mean that I uh, neglect the effect of, of society in even the way students sit in class. And student seating, as you know, is a very big issue when it comes to differences in But I also would like to thank you uh, uh, very much for this uh, interesting claim and, and, and scientific proof that all areas can actually, you know, uh, um, intervene together in justifying why uh, uh, males and, and, and females have gender differences to and I was very happy, you know, for uh, listening to your proofs and Dr. Wells proofs. They are very uh, uh, clear. Thank you. Thank you. Amira? Well, um, I'd like to start with extending my um, big, big thank you to Dr. England and Dr. Whale for two reasons. I love the mix that you both did uh, integrating between uh, uh, the personal experience reasons uh, shared by Dr. England to prove her stance, uh, along with uh, the deep statistics uh, shared by Dr. Whale that made a real uh, good balance, actually. Um, the thing is, um, I would uh, confirm what uh, Dr. Hagek has just mentioned. Researching on both sides, endless number of research statistics and results that prove both sides, actually, uh, either for or against. And uh, I trust it depends on so many different factors, not only the cognitive ones, not only the social ones, but uh, also the cultural ones and other more that we do not know yet. And they are still under investigation. Uh, this is why I usually think that it will always go by heart. Um, each of us has kind of a personal um, belief uh, as per uh, his or her own personal experience, teaching and learning, and his or her own learning uh, found, it, uh, found studies, uh, research outcomes that would prove such stance or another. Uh, I know that Dr. Hane would say now, would remember now, like how hard was it to choose? Is it for or against? Again, I told Dr. Hane, well, let me think about it. Let me research both sides. And then you know what? It's really hard. By heart, by heart, um, I think I'm for this. This is why only going for heart based on our own personal experience and um, um, teaching or learning experience, this, is, this can be a guideline for us. Uh, but statistically, uh, research-wise, yes, there's always something to prove. Yes, definitely. Mm. This is why, uh, thank you, Dr. Hanef, for the choice, the hard, challenging <laughs> choice, actually. <clears throat> uh, before I make any comments, please, now, where ill, Dr. England, Dr. England, where ill, would you like to make any sort of rebuttals? Dr. England? I, I'm, uh, I sense that we've raised some really useful issues here for folks, which is what this whole event is designed to do. Um, um, I think, in, as particularly as Dr. Amira was talking, I was thinking about my classrooms at AUC and how I believe that I made special efforts for the male students because I felt that they were minority <laughs> and I needed to make sure I didn't give preference to the female students. So we had exercises where, you know, they would move their chair and they would sit with other groups and so on. Um, and so my, my own consciousness about differences in students and in terms of gender was really form, formatted at the AUC because it was a place for me to really walk the walk as we say in American. Yeah, I, had to, I really had to make sure that I can give preferential treatment to the female students because I'm a woman. I don't know if it's useful. Dr. Weil will cite the research for me. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> well, in, in my rebuttal, <clears throat> I would like to introduce some uh, plausible interpretations of the tricky gender difference, again, between males and females. And, and the first set of interpretations, which is gaining attention um, 
at least uh, towards the beginning of the third millennium uh, has been the impact of families as factors affecting gender differences in learning outcomes. Because the family environment itself, in terms of home resources, family activities, parental involvement, even parental background itself, uh, parental education, family income, <clears throat> parental attitudes, and even family size are all offered as having a critical impact on girls' education uh, in the developed and in the developing countries. So um, um, the effect size of family background is generally much larger than cognitive uh, differences or abilities. Uh, a, second, uh, a second set of interpretations would be actually traced to the affective domain, mm. the cognitive domain. Uh, and this was highlighted by Bloom uh, um, during the 50s and 60s. Uh, the affective domain, the interest of the learner, and above all, the motivation of the learner makes a lot of difference. Uh, in, a, in a 1995 study by Katsambia, um, uh, it was reported that a decline in girls' attitude and self-concept towards science accompanies the occurrence of the male advantage advanced achievement. Uh, OECD in 2001 suggested that gender differences in performance, reading, and mathematical literacy are closely mirrored in students' interest in the respective subject area. So the affective domain, the motivation of the learners and their interest plays a key role, much a much bigger role than their cognitive abilities. Um, the, all the interpretations I'm citing here actually run counter to uh, the individual differences or yeah. the psychological framework which started to explain gender, gender differences. So the very traditional framework of interpretation was based on psychology and uh, the individual differences theory. A third uh, potential interpretation uh, cites that the scope and magnitude of gender differences are largely a result of how boys and girls learn school subjects in our education systems. And this is a result of the educational interventions on school policies and classroom practices, which aimed at reducing gender differences. So now, um, perhaps starting 30 or 40 years ago, the women's movement took traction and issues of uh, gender inequality, they started to come to the forefront. Right now, in scholarships, for example, or, uh, or in the whole world, there is what's known as positive discrimination. They, <laughs> they discriminate for females <laughs> to, to make it up for them. I couldn't get a scholarship at University of London because of <laughs> positive discrimination. However, uh, a, a great effect on female achievement in schools and in universities can be traced to such interventions, which are socio-political, yeah. not cognitive, it's socio-political. And again, from the socio-psychological perspective, schools as the key social institution in the life of students are critical to account for gender differences in learning outcomes. This is to say that the school and teachers play uh, a huge role on the achievement of learning outcomes with the affective domain uh, and the interest. Hence, school policy and classroom practice 
which is based on teachers, are important educational experiences, uh, are important descriptors or factors which account for gender difference in learning outcomes. The final uh, interpretation, which is largely acceptable uh, in the field, has to do with gender stereotypes. Yeah. And gender stereotypes are based on the proposition that self-perceptions of students on their abilities correspond to beliefs of their significant others. Significant others may include teachers, parents, and peers. The theoretical framework of gender stereotype is developed to explain engendered academic differences. Gender stereotypes can transmit into culture by means of mass media, toys, books, and can be reinforced by significant others. Again, gender stereotypes are likely to make their way into school policies in which administrators limit access to one gender and into classroom practice in which teachers discourage one gender both because of their stereotyped gender notions. So gender stereotypes do influence behaviors, expectations, beliefs, and beliefs of administrators and teachers, and do filter through them to students. Hence, gender stereotypes can actually account for both numbers and uh, achievement of learning outcomes uh, between males and females. It can be a whole societal stereotype or expectation that females are better in reading, they uh, should be delicate, they should be nice, they don't have to engage in fights, they cannot work in the army, or even they're more expressive than males. All this can be attributed to gender stereotype, which is a social theory. So what, what I finally want yeah. to conclude with, sorry? Ooh. Did I go over time or do anything wrong? <laughs> um, my, my, my conclusion here is that First of all, the evidence in gender differences is very tricky and controversial. Uh, it's not consistent across countries. It's not consistent across subject matters. It's not consistent across geographic regions. Therefore, um, voices can attach this phenomenon to politics or to larger social movements like the feminist movement, like uh, international politics, which want to pressure developing countries in a certain direction, uh, it can be taken there. Uh, uh, on the one hand, on the other hand, the main uh, explanatory factors of this phenomenon should be above all uh, social. Mm -hmm. one, one last comment, actually, which I heard from a colleague uh, in the UCCD project. Um, she, she said that right now males seek higher paying jobs. So they prefer to start their own projects. They prefer to work in business. They prefer to work in international organizations. But uh, th this left women or females with a larger area to occupy in social institutions. Uh, and this may account for the fact that numbers of women out to outweigh numbers of males in education. Uh, lots of women are teachers, but teaching is not a high paying job. Huh? And again, even the economic factors will take you to social theory at the end of the day. Uh, the, the, the evidence supporting the cognitive interpretation of the difference will be uh, normally traced to individual differences and to psychology in the early uh, days of the movement. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Well, I have to throw in some rebuttals here just to share what I have. I mean, there was some reason why I, I just made that proposition. I mean, yes, there are cognitive differences. And I've based that on some findings and some claims by very esteemed like um, researchers here. To, uh, to everyone, it's not you, nothing personal. I'm so sorry about the, you know, uh, the bias against you as a male. And you respond when it... to me, I respond to you, Anna. No, 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 no. This is a general comment. Take it, I mean, as you wish here. There is that observation that language departments and universities always seem to have a majority of women students. That's just, isn't that right? I'm just asking everyone here. Yes or no? It's a simple yes. Yes. Or That's no. true. That's true. We have almost 400 females and around 12 males. See, what do you have to say, Well, I mean, you were there. You've been, okay, how was it? And thanks for asking me. Well, uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not opposing the fact that females outnumber males. So here we're agree in I'm agreement. I'm, yeah. I'm actually agreeing to this. I okay. even presented ev evidence which supports that females outdo males in learning outcomes. Of course. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they, they, they learn better. And in, in many countries, there is the fear that males are underachieving <laughs> in reading. That's sad. Uh, yeah. So females are doing fine. I'm, I'm just opposing the statement that they're doing fine or they're, they're outnumbering uh, men in studying language. And they're outdoing males in achievement of learning outcomes because of cognitive factors. No. I disagree to this. I believe this, this phenomenon is due to the interpretations which I cited, which are all social. In terms of female motivation, for example, women now uh, are very much more motivated than men to study. Uh, dropout rates in males are higher. Uh, males want money. Alas, females want to prove themselves more. This is all motivation. It, it's not cognitive. It has nothing to do with uh, your ability to process information. Nobody said that, by ability. the way. Nobody this said is, that. Okay. Uh, allow me. Allow me uh, just to say something here. It's one so of they, those they things. Number for cognitive reasons. No, yeah, I disagree. I still stand. Okay. Stand uh, out number for cognitive. Okay, Sorry? out number for cognitive, and I'm going to share something here with you. Shall I? Mm -hmm. It says here men and women uh, uh, actually, in terms of brain, uh, you know, functioning, uh, lateralization of the brain, uh, the right side and the left side. Okay, you've come across mm -hmm. that, haven't you? I mean, I, there were like. Uh, oh, there was research and it proved, I mean, the areas, how we function. So um, men tend to have one part of the brain only functioning when it's language, okay, language processing. And women somehow have both parts, both hem hemispheres sort of interacting when it has to do with language. That males, for example, need visual support in order to process language, all right? Uh, they just d don't uh, do abstractions as fast as uh, women do. Women do not necessarily need that visual support. And I can, because you're quoting so many um, elaborate research findings, I just came across that very interesting one. Let's hear me out here. It says, uh, uh, it says there is that conclusion here that women are more open to new incoming forms and this at the same time use a higher frequency of standard or prestigious forms than do men okay adapting so here it's about the frequency um they uh, actually um use a higher frequency of standard prestigious forms than men do well um in comparison men tend to use uh you know um 
interestingly, swear words, for example, that's an area where they excel. That was interesting to find. And that does not show in the performance, okay, academic performance, because, I mean, come on, in academic uh, context, you account for, okay, academic proper English and stuff. So women sort of like ignore that area, plus they don't go for interlanguage stuff. Their accuracy is higher for that reason. They pick, okay, um, you know, very prestigious, you know, functions and so on. Uh, I don't have much to say, but I mean, Rod Ellis said that. So when you hear Rod Ellis, you should really uh, Type, can I respond? listen. Yeah, please. Okay, but we'll, we'll take one minute, 60 seconds. Okay. Yani, I wait or respond? Lala, take, take one, 60 seconds for rebuttal. Well, the, the area of brain hemisphericity and the area of learning styles and strategies occur in the first place to support the claim that males and females are different. Mm. Not the claim that males are better than females or females are better than males. And I definitely agree that males and females are different. They are different in the way they see the world they're different in the way they learn. And let me remind you that even males are different within because there are right-brained men, left-brained men, and whole-brained men like myself. <laughs> I'm whole-brained, which is the no... no which is very confusing, yes. <laughs> which is the no-preference arena. So I can operate right-brain, left-brain, logic, uh, imagination, I'm all yours. <laughs> uh, I'm fine. I'm, I have no problem in this. I can learn by hearing. I can learn by seeing. Um, that's fine. I'm no preference. So the, the main claim or the main thesis in this case is that females are different from males. Not that females outdo males or outnumber males. The, there is no supremacy in, in this area. And also, uh, there is very interesting recent evidence uh, which is accumulating against learning styles and against the traditional models of brain hemisphericity, uh, which claim that the theory is not very uh, adequate. And again, it will take you to background societal factors uh, particularly the family uh, background. The, the family background plays a key role, key role in gender difference and in the whole field of educational inequality. The, the, the family background is uh, huge. Thank so I you. I agree oh. that males and females are different. They are different and they actually should be different. Well, uh, this is the nature of life. But I totally disagree that either of them is supreme to the other. The, the, the supremacy argument is not, not necessarily valid. Uh, Although no. you, you excel in spatial thinking. I right? have a and comment, Doctor. doctor yes, I, Dr. I Hageg, have, please. Doctor, one minute comment. Um, there are, uh, you know, two ashes that uh, I think I have to highlight. Number one, we're not talking about the existence of the set equipment, but we're talking about the faculty of the uh, of this equipment and 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 whether it is a gender biased equipment or not. And uh, we have lots of researches that proved and claimed. Not let, let's let's say claimed, not proved that it is gender the biased set. Okay, starting from the multiple intelligence theory and other and all the other theories. This is this is number one, and the other uh, point is in this debate we're not uh, proving that the the uh, uh, the cognitive approach is right or wrong or the uh, social approach is right or wrong. They are existed. They are correct. They have lots of. They are actually schools. They they even call it the cognitive school and the social school. So yeah. they are they are there. They both. Uh, claim and justify, you know, the, uh, uh, gender differences in language. But we're in this motion, we're going, I believe we're going for to which pile 
okay, you're going on. To which side you think that this is, but we're not, you know, proving that this is correct or this is uh, right. So because it's very, uh, to me, dangerous to say that that uh, a cognition is not a factor in, 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 in language learning differences. It is a factor as well as society, as you have just uh, proved it mentioned. So these are two points I wanted to highlight. Sorry for- Great, great, Dr. Hagag. Exactly my point here. We're not talking supremacy. It's about who excels in which, all right? And as I've just mentioned, spatial intelligence and spatial uh, faculty in, in uh, males, evidently it's by even, you know, um, real life, okay, observation. They excel better. Yeah, some women do um, well, a little, okay. But if you just make observations, generalizations, males do better in spatial uh, kind of tasks. Interestingly, I would like to share the pre-poll results here. I started this in Facebook and it was like, I would say like 25% versus like 75%. 25% were um, actually uh, for the cognitive argument, 75% uh, were for the societal social argument. Interestingly, in this room, we have, I would say 39% for cognitive, 48% for the social societal and 13% other. See the diversity here. It's interesting. Yeah, through the discussion here, I think people are really considering. I'm going to have another uh, closing poll if time allows to share uh, the kind of like uh, feedback from the audience here. I would like to share a very short uh, anecdote here by a male teacher surrounded by women. All right, would you like to hear that? All right, it says I'm a male teacher surrounded by women, but please don't call me a victim. That's how it starts, yeah. Don't call me a victim. I do not systematically catalog instances in which I perceive myself to be discriminated against or subject to artificial barriers. However, during this time, a number of my experiences could certainly be, be taken as evidence of discrimination if I were eager to interpret the actions of those around me in the most negative possible manner. In one case, it was assumed that I was a parent of a young child and not the teacher. On another, another occasion, huh, uh, people presumed that I would prefer to teach older children since that would uh, actually follow the usual pattern among male teachers. In another instance, I sat uh, around a table in the staff room as the lone male and listened uh, as female teachers discuss some wild experiences, all right? So um, actually here, the guy is saying here, uh, this gender-based difference in professional uh, preferences should not surprise anyone since men and women have different kinds of brains. On average, men are more interested in things and less interested in people. They underperform in verbal fluency compared to women and uh, score lower on uh, that uh, big five personality trait of agreeableness, among other things. At the end of the day, women and men are different and they will make different choices in deciding what to do with their lives. Instead, uh, some studies, okay, indicate that more gender uh, equity, um, especially in European countries, as we just mentioned earlier on, actually, uh, as more gender equity exists in a society, the more men and women tend to embrace certain stereotypical career tracks. How does that strike you as an anecdote of a teacher, a lone teacher, a minority? Yeah. It is no comment. Have you ever experienced that feeling of being a, you know, a minority? Whatever you are working now, yeah. you counted the number of uh, male doctors and professors in universities and female doctors and professors. They do outnumber uh, males with actually around uh, seventy to thirty, 
and this is a big shift in even the Egyptian society because we used yeah. you know to 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 have the difference for the most part. So uh, I, I think the world is is having something with the, with this thing. Even the United States, they have this boys crisis in in two thousand six. I think Professor Liz, and it was a very big issue there. So I think yeah. we have a. Uh, yeah, we have a global uh, 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 boys' crisis that goes on there in the field of foreign language learning. Yeah, I mean, the the issue of gender discrimination it can go either way. The women are discriminated against, the men are discriminated against, and in either case, it is political, as we were saying before. It doesn't matter how good you are, how bad you are, you could have done something terrible, but it's about the politics. And this is what you learn in your career, that it isn't about whether you're male or female. I mean, if you were to create the perfect experiment and put, you know, exact same conditions, this is what Skinner did with his own child, you know, you, you have exactly the same conditions for a, a boy and a girl, and then you look at them 10 years later. I mean, I would argue that you would probably uh, not see much difference. Well, well, I can argue even this because in cognitive uh, 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 psychology, uh, they say that, and I have proofs for this also that if, you know, uh, boys and girls are, are socially and economically and politically equal, equal. Yeah. yes, there would be differences in their language use in three areas, in word level, sentence living, and even, you know, the, 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 the number of vocabulary they're having. Yeah. So there is something next to the society. There something is something next to the political, the politics. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and you can reverse here. It's that in the literature, they reverse yeah. Uh, that argument. So actually men outnumber women in fields of STEM, okay? So <laughs> science, technology, um, uh, you know, uh, E4, I always forget the E. Um, say that again? Yeah, STEM, uh, S4, yeah, T4, technology, E4, engineering, yes, and M4, math. So yeah, the, the reverse is also true. Men outnumber women. I mean, how many uh, engineers do you find in a company? Or well, and a friend just said math? this no, you know, the, the countries doing the best with the COVID have something in common with each other. The countries doing the worst with COVID have something in common with each other. <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's true. So uh, before uh, we make our closing statements for this very interesting debate indeed, uh, would you like to say, take some comments from the audience? I mean, I can open the floor if, if people would like to raise uh, their hand and ask a question to one, uh, to one or, or, I mean, to any of our debaters or discussants for today, we'd, have, we'd be more than happy to receive that. So anybody? Raising a hand, let's check. Or type in the chat box. <clears throat> Anybody? Not yet. So yeah, we do have uh, one of the questions here. This is Mr. Khamis Hegezi. Uh, please, uh, Mr. Khamis, you can speak now. Thank Ask you away. very much. Thank you very much for this fabulous debate. I enjoyed the session really. Thanks a lot. Just maybe the number of ladies, this is one thing, and they are distinguished really in their skills of speaking. Sometimes when we listen to a male or a female in the listening, it's more clear to hear the language from a female. So most of the recordings for teaching in Egypt prefer females. Well, this, any, any this, of our discussants would like to address that. I'd like to thank you all, all the team. Thank you, you did a great job today. Thank you, thank you very, very much. Thank it's you. Just, I may link this to the uh, uh, one uh, one stage of uh, foreign language learning, which is this drilling and imitation. When you learn foreign language, you have to drill and imitate. 
And the way you talk similarly to the natives, this is a plus for your language learning development. Females can do this more than males in, in imitating even the accent, the way you'll be speaking and so on. This is, this is a plus for the learning. Um, and Dr. Hana, if I may add the one Please. thing, you would, uh, I can definitely relate uh, this last comment uh, to um, one of the comments at the chat box, actually. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm reading her name right or not. Uh, so Suhasini. Exactly. So has seen it. Yes, you got my point. Uh, it's actually matching this. Uh, she says like she thinks a beginning mother um, who teaches us language in a fantastic way. Her approach is awesome uh, and it has different impact. Yes, actually it goes by nature. Mothers probably are better uh, teacher, uh, although that they are teaching for the kids different languages. Kids, again, they are just like born and they do not know anything. They do not know anything to compare to. So again, I trust like if it were he, the dad, not the mom, uh, uh, we wouldn't have such uh, same successful results as uh, mothers do. Thank you for that, Amira. Uh, there seems to be a comment here uh, from Nagla. She says, we need to look at the process as something to emphasize on, not on genders, okay? We need to consider people who have the uh, ability to learn devotedly and encourage regardless of the gender. Interesting comment here. Emeni Khreiba uh, would like to uh, ask a question. Emeni, now you can uh, um, ask your question, ask away. Uh -huh. Hi, Dr. Hanna. Hi, all of you. It was so beneficial and especially I'd like to um, say hi to Wael because uh, Wael was my colleague yeah, in, uh, at college. Yes, hi Wael, I missed you. You're very kidding much. me. No, yes. not, not yes, again. Yes. I mean, all these coincidences. Emeni and Wael, same yeah, thing. Oh my yeah, God. <laughs> uh, we'll so, take this uh, offline. <laughs> Okay, Hannah. So I just wanted to uh, clarify something. Uh, we voted, most of us voted that uh, women just study languages because of societal and social uh, circumstances or whatever. I think studying languages is the best for women because by nature, you know, they are sort of talented in speaking, maybe listening and imitating things. And as Dr. Amira clarified, uh, according to Nagla's uh, comment, uh, mothers are able to teach their children everything since their childhood, their early childhood. But uh, this is not just related to teachers at schools. Ladies and females prove themselves to succeed in all ages or with, with teaching for all ages. You know, they are, I think, they are more comprehensive. They can easily understand others. They maybe uh, have some pity on them and try to be uh, calm to some extent or quite more than males. So I think this is one of the reasons that push ladies and females to work in the field of teaching, uh, uh, regardless of the ages they teach. I think so. Thank you. Hello? Hello? Anybody yeah. would like to make a comment on that? I can all hear you. Yeah. Anybody saying hi to maybe Wael, say hi to Emeni. Never oh, yeah. thought you, you are the same cohort. I mean, that's we really were amazing. close friends, by the way. <laughs> I can't imagine. Okay. Life, okay. It's a small world once again. Yes. Uh, Nagla says here, I expect more encouragement from big organization. Nagla, would you like to unmute yourself or let me unmute you so you can elaborate on this. I mean, what do you mean by big organization should encourage? Encourage what? Teaching or learning different languages. I mean, maybe, yeah. Would you like to make a comment? Any of our speakers, yes? Yes? 
I'm, I'm just trying to understand the question. Uh, yeah, I mean, I asked her if she would uh, like to join us in, okay, uh, by speaking, uh, just asking the question or elaborating on it. So uh, it's like, uh, yeah, yeah, well. All big organizations are encouraging. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I understand where you're coming from. Yeah, they are too much, okay. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, giving too much encouragement to uh, girls. Yeah, okay, it's a negative kind of bias now. It's like, yeah, you know, yeah. over encouraging yeah. girls. I can tell. Men to some extent, yeah. Poor men, poor yeah. men now yeah. don't stand a chance in this world. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> just buddy, anybody would Amira? Yes. Just saying something, Doctor Well. Maybe it's the payback time. Uh, I mean, like men used to be a bit, a bit uh, more privileged than women for decades, and it's time to be a bit unfair to men, so we can have the world balance again for a few years. Uh, but this uh, still keeps us feeling sorry for your <laughs> for the for the case that men are turning to be kind of minority in the teaching and learning fields. But I mean, have you ever felt well, and Dr. Hagag, have you ever felt in this uh, discussion we've ha we're having, have you ever felt like you're at a disadvantage or being like you know, um, um, I would say um, maybe anybody practicing any sort of bias against you? Any, any anything of that? Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you, you felt you felt at a disadvantage today. Um, I am a, a graduate from a governmental governmental school, and Same and you here. know, yeah, um, you know, uh, the environment in the governmental schools is actually uh, distinctive in Egypt and and and, and different. So. The way you learn foreign language in uh, in a public school, uh, especially in uh, in most of the African countries, actually is very challenging for uh, for you as a learner. So we were trying to imitate how you know Americans speak and how the uh, uh, British speak, and you can't imagine how how we were you know mocked and criticized and and and, and biased according even to the way you. You, you talk the way uh, you, the way they talk. So this is also one proof that society has an effect in uh, whether you know males or females um, 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 outnumber. Um, but yes, there is some kind of, of, of bias. It's the human nature. It's you know uh, yeah. Uh, you know uh, uh, there is an interesting uh, online uh, questionnaire for uh, how biased you are and. If you noticed, or uh, if you if you went through the items of the scale, you will find that there are lots of things, of words, of actions we do in a biased basis, but we are not aware of doing it. We just do it the way you know, unconsciously, and so on. So there is bias, even in. in or biased in, by nature. Yes, it's it's something. I, I I don't want to have this claim, but that's true. Oh, yeah, yeah. It uh, is in a way true. I mean, we're yeah. all we all sort. To like have certain backgrounds and preferences so exactly. definitely we demonstrate here you know and we are inclined to our preferences no matter yeah. what yeah 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 exactly. we are biased by nature i'm not referring to women i'm referring to human <laughs> beings we as women. as human beings yes definitely as human. Towards, did i practice any bias toward the gentleman in this room any I bias any gentleman do you think so i mean <laughs> I was fair. I, I tried my best. Anyways, um, would you like to kindly make our sorry? Yeah, and for you to be fair, we need you to cite some hardcore evidence supporting our uh, argument. I did. You're better in spatial, uh, you know, uh, abilities and spatial tasks. You do no. very well in that, uh, you know. And, and you're relation. you're better in listening tasks. You okay as. Uh, Males generally. Thesis, I mean, in support of the social. Well, uh, you see, I mean, I I still well the motion I was, I mean, my still okay. I still think there is the cognitive part for sure. I would not deny honestly here the societal factors, environmental societal factors. That's for sure. To be very honest, 
And let me share the reason behind this whole statement, really. Okay, I wanted to reverse, number one here, the STEM kind of like argument, which is raised so much. All right, so I wanted to turn this on its head. So yeah, you say that, yeah, women are outnumbered in STEM fields. Uh, now, what about the other side? The second reason was a very, com a, a very good friend and colleague of uh, ours, Wail, I'm sure you know him. It was Mustafa that really actually, uh, Mustafa Youssef, he asked me this question because we were just talking about, uh, can you please access, okay, or can you please talk to fellow colleagues where you work? He told me, I'm the only gentleman in the whole uh, college. I told him, what about the rest of like, you know, uh, faculty members? Well, he just said, no one, I don't know anyone there. It's like, and I really don't know. Do you have any idea where this is? Uh, I mean, why this is the case? I told him, yeah, I think I, I do. And it's not just restricted to Egypt. I mean, I travel to TESOLs around the world and I see more women than men. I mean, look around, IATFL, TESOL, Etc. Etc. More uh, women are into literature as a you know liberal arts and literature studies, as well as language studies. So it's an observation, and it's not restricted to Egypt. That's what I told him, and actually he's the inspiration why, yeah. So uh, um, actually why I sort of put that motion out this way just trying to just get at some objective reasons, okay, why this might be the case. At least we have touched upon that. So I'd like to thank Mustafa Yusuf for that. And thank you uh, all for that. Amira, please, you wanna make a comment? As you mentioned about the STEM education, uh, counting on my um, experience, professional experience in the STEM education project since it started here in Egypt. Um, and uh, I spent kind of like six years or so um, actually comparing between the number of uh, male and female applicants to the STEM schools uh, along all those years, they were almost the very same number. Uh, we used to have some separate schools for males, other separate schools for females. Uh, sometimes in the other governments, the same school has both male sections and female sections. They are still the same, the same applicants, the same numbers. People who drop off the STEM education system for different reasons. Uh, again, it used to be almost the same, males and females. It was not kind of, yeah, because students used to live in a dorm, so that was really hard for girls, harder than for boys. No, same challenges, same problems, and same achievements. The last thing was like the graduates of the STEM school, the number of students, males, versus females who graduated and joined international programs in the highest and top ranked universities, males were almost the same number as females. Again, I'm speaking statistically, uh, although that was really hard thinking about like the cultural support of the parents, of the teachers, of the society for the girls who travel just like she just finished their high school, now move on and jump into a different country, different culture, da, 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 and you're still young. Yes, that was quite encouraged. This is why I think what really matters is the culture, the culture in the society where we live. It's not the society itself, it's not the cognitive only, but mainly, mainly the culture. This is what we need to work on. This is what teachers probably need to encourage parents uh, through teaching the kids to spread this culture around. Both are able to do. The thing is who gets the opportunity to excel better? Interesting. Uh, let's make our uh, closing comments, I guess, because let me tell you, we're 15 minutes past the hour, uh, actually, uh, the 90 minutes we were supposed to have. So I don't want to keep our esteemed uh, discussions here any longer. So would you like to make your final closing comments? Uh, who would like to go first? Uh, how about how about the opposite? Okay, the opposing team first. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Thank you all. I learned so much today. Um, the the Egyptian perspective on this issue or these issues we've we've really uncovered. I think five or six issues. Um, but the way in which 
um, this discussion has gone has allowed me to, to get a better idea of what we're doing and why it is that sometimes we have conflicts between men and women and why it is that that's not really the issue. It's often other issues that are tangled up in it. Thank you for helping me to understand that. Thank you to Wael, especially for his, his excellent effort to give us some real uh, evidence-based background on our side. I still feel really strongly about sociocultural, but I understand cognitive in a new way. Family changes, there's cognitive stuff going on there with um, girls' education, self-perception and confidence issues and gender stereotypes. All of those issues that we talked about are uh, really in a state of flux now. And I am going to think some more and read some more. And I hope each of you goes away with uh, one, one new idea about um, gender and gender differences. Thanks so much. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you, Dr. Inglet. That was amazing. Huh? Where would you like to make a final closing comment? Well, uh, my, my closing uh, comment actually is about how to respond uh, to the uh, explanatory factors uh, of gender difference. And the, the main way to respond to that is through a differentiated curriculum and a differentiated instruction uh, in classrooms. Um, I guess this is the trend globally now that curricula are differentiated. Males and females are equally represented in uh, curricula. And differentiated instruction in classrooms is gaining more and more traction. So the, the issue is not really uh, in the ability to learn as much as it is in the, the learning environment and in the larger um, socio-political, economic uh, processes which are in play. Um, I, I definitely, uh, I have lived uh, myself in the English department in Helwan University. We were like 90 faculty members with only 13 gentlemen. Uh, this is the case of English departments in Ain Shams, in Alson, in Zagazig even. But if you go to the Arabic department at the Faculty of Arts, the, you will find the other way around. Yeah, it's yeah. the other way around. And yeah. if, uh, absolutely, it's definitely the other way around with total domination. Uh, First language versus foreign language. Oh, that yeah. could be one factor. Uh, well, Again, I will go to social factors which have to do with females being um, more motivated to learn, so they get better grades, so they go to English departments, not to Arabic departments, because English departments and French departments are highly selective. They require very high grades in language. And males tend to have that uh, antithetical um, attitude towards schools. W when we were in secondary schools, we did not buy into the school. We don't care much if teachers love us. <laughs> we care more for having fun, for joking, for proving that we are strong, for fighting. Huh? Very aggressive. Yeah, I came across that in so, the studies. Yes, yeah, males tend other, to be more aggressive. In other words, males don't seek social acceptance. Um, I mean, males in uh, school age are not seeking social acceptance. Females out of gender stereotypes do. So they care more for teachers liking them. They listen more. And uh, combine this with motivation, they get better grades, so they go to better departments. Uh, if you change the faculty altogether and go to the faculty of medicine, for example, you will find huge male dominance. <laughs> huge. That's what I said. Medicine, STEM uh, fields, basically, 
and of course, particularly math, but, math departments. But, but, uh, no, but, but this is again a social process where, where families push their kids to go to science and math. Uh, families want their kids, especially males, to be like them, doctors, engineers. So they give them uh, a huge push and they go to the science section, get higher grades and go to uh, faculty of medicine. Again, there is a gender stereotype that a female cannot work in a factory, a female, it's dangerous for a female to work in a um, petroleum field, for example. All these gender stereotypes uh, uh, push males and females in different directions, uh, especially in Egypt. Mm -hmm. So it's not always free will. Not it's in not the US. Admission. There are always social pressures in the back. And the way to properly address these is through education policy. A differentiated curriculum, uh, this is the role of the state, actually. And it's the duty of the intellectuals and the intelligentsia in the community. They address those differences, they clarify them to audiences, and uh, the curriculum becomes differentiated and instruction in classrooms becomes differentiated. This will empower both males and females to choose freely or to have uh, at least their interest, their true, uh, first of all, they need to understand themselves better and then uh, be able to choose freely. And thank you very much for the engaging debate and for the efforts of uh, all colleagues. Thank you, Well, Really, thanks. Um, how about Amira and then Dr. Hagek? Uh, well, um, I'd like to extend my uh, gratitude and thanks to everybody here, but mainly for the participants, the teachers uh, who, are, who have been uh, taking uh, the burden of listening to all those numbers, statistics, research, research results of uh, the both stances for and against. Um, this is why I would only uh, sum it up to um, kind of a short message to the teachers. Yes, uh, regardless of the fact if it would end up to be kind of for cognitive reasons or for social reasons or for this or that or even more that we don't know anything about, we as teachers, we are the closest. We are in the closest contact to the students. So whenever we are in contact with any male or female student who is learning a uh, foreign language, we can always find the clue of each student in order to encourage him, encourage him as a male, encourage her as a female, encourage him or her as a young little teenager, encourage him as a young doctor, uh, a young an engineer, whoever. We just need to have a better and a deeper insight towards our students. This will help us to tackle and to trigger the those parts in their minds that we do not know anything about, uh, regardless the social uh, effects and the political uh, barriers that would help them to excel whenever they get to learn foreign languages. It's all about you. It's all about us as teachers, only teachers. Even if we have the worst political system, the worst uh, culture, the worst educational system, it's we, we and them, direct contact. Think about it this way. This way. We are the strongest here. Thank you. Thank you. A very strong message, Amira. Last but definitely not least, Dr. Hagek, would you kindly now give your closing statement? I would like to thank you all for this uh, wonderful uh, privilege of being with you. And um, since this is not, you know, um, a conference to discuss academic papers or results and so on, and 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 since this is. Uh, uh, powered by uh, uh, RELO and American University and... Uh, RELO is not here today oh, sorry, uh, sorry, as a supporter. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, this is AUC. AUC. Yeah. PG committee only. Well, yeah, RELO. Yeah. It, maybe going, there, maybe not. Yeah. So yeah. RELO is lurking in the audience. I saw them somewhere. Yeah. Is that Hane yeah. Sudin? Probably. Yeah, I, I saw one of them. This is why I mentioned RELO. Really. <laughs> As a participant, Ahmed East, East is, uh, well. is a partner, 
yeah, actually no. lurking. Okay, so yeah. we have Ahmed East today. We yeah, do I'm have just... Rilo today. Yeah. Uh, both uh, are partners of Nile Tea. Exactly. So based on this uh, partners uh, session, I'm going for the um, uh, the applied part of or the aim or the heart of this uh, discussion, which is supporting foreign language learning and teaching in Egypt, I think. And uh, uh, I have a claim, which is uh, foreign language assessment in Egypt is not gender neutral. Why? Because any teacher, even you know, the attendants can prove this. When you design your test, you don't look for whether this is for males and, uh, males and females. You just change the, the heating of it. And this is a dangerous thing because it is different to write a two-page paragraph, two-page essay from one paragraph or for uh, or a paragraph. You know, males and females different in this. It's it's different. You know, when you ask for a diagram, writing a diagram or drawing a picture, you will find gender differences and and the drawing and so on. We have to think of the assessment practices that can be related or attributed to gender differences. We have one exam in the high school or in the secondary school that goes for all of Egypt and may not claim some differences to my knowledge between you know, uh, uh, males and females. We have to think of these practices more than you know, researchers. Of course, research results are important, but going for applying these results into actual classroom practices, I think this will support both female and male foreign languages. This is perfect, yes, very true. Thank you. Thank you. And I would like to close by this statement. Whether you're a male teacher surrounded by women or uh, a female teacher surrounded by men, you're no victim. Never call yourself victim. Teachers are strong, as Amira said. Uh, can't thank you enough. <laughs> the equation. Well, yes. Yeah, you can be an empowerer. That's one of your roles. If you can really actually um, practice that role uh, well. Uh, thank you very much for making this a wonderful debate. Dr. England, thank you. Il, pleasure. a real pleasure and honor having you here. Inspiring indeed. Uh, hope we have more of that in, in uh, some other occasions in, in the future. We do appreciate your time and effort here. Uh, thank you to all our audience members here who uh, took that, that, that much time here to join us today. Uh, today is uh, July the 15th. Um, now it's around 10 p.m. Cairo time, 30 minutes extra here, I'm sorry. Now, uh, this is PD committee uh, from Nile Tisel, Hene Khamis. Thank you very much and see you all sometime very soon, hopefully after COVID-19. You take Thank care. You Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was a privilege. A real privilege. Privilege, Dr. Haggag, Wail, and Amir. Dr. Haggag. Join us in the social network. will do great. Yeah, of course. This Wonderful. The social. Everyone time. is looking forward to that kind of social gathering. Yeah. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Let a real pleasure. Thanks a million. We were really, uh, really, actually, we've learned a lot today. Thank you. Thank you and see you soon for those attending, uh, you know, the conference, uh, not a TESOL International Conference. And who knows, maybe a night TESOL Conference in case it's virtual as well. Who knows? Okay. We'll see about that. Bye. Thank Have you. a wonderful night. Thank Bye. You. Bye for now.